I would like to get across three uh, specific points for us to understand today. One is that eternity is the default existence. All we know is a temporary existence. All we know in our universe is temporary. It is temporary. It uh, stars form, stars are created, and they die. Planets die. Everything we know on the earth has a, a beginning and has had or will have an end. Now, stay with me and try to pay attention because some of this is, you know, you have to, you have to think about it. <clears throat> the universe is not all there is. Now, we know God's Word tells us that, but I'm saying it is obvious by observation that the universe is not all there is. The universe is composed mostly of matter. There is antimatter, and there are uh, things in the universe like dark matter that exists that we do not see. Many things we don't see. We don't see air, you know? So there's many things that we do not see, but they exist. There's evidence that they're there because of how they affect the environment around whatever they're around. We don't see atoms, but we know atoms are there, and everything is made up of atoms. Now, the universe is not all there is. Now, think about this. God created the universe. The universe, uh, Edwin Hubble discovered in 1929, you know, that's who the, the uh, Hubble telescope that they have put in space brings back those fantastic uh, pictures from outer space. He discovered in 1929 that the universe was expanding. And he could tell because of the red shift in the distant stars. It is accepted today that this universe had a specific beginning and came into existence from nothing. Now they used to not say that. They used to say, I don't have an ink pen, but you know what an ink, the head of an ink pen is. They would say smaller than the tip of this ink pen. All the planets and the entire universe, all the galaxies, every, you know, all the stars, everything, dark matter that we don't see, but we know is there, antimatter, it all came from a the tip, like from the tip of a pen, but now they've just reduced it to everything we see came from nothing. And that's exactly what Hebrews 11, verse 3 says. That by the word of God, we understand that everything that we see was created, everything visible was created from things we do not see, that we're not seeing. Space is not empty. As uh, commonly, astronomers will refer to outer space as empty space. Now, you might say, of course it's not empty. There's galaxies out there. There's quasars out there. I'm talking about beyond the universe. Now, listen to me. The universe is growing. The universe was a certain size when I began this sermon. And it's a different size right now. And now it's another size. Because the galaxies are the, the galaxies are, 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 that are going away in every single direction from the moment that God said, be. That's all he had to say, is be. The I am means no beginning, no end. I exist, I am that I am. 
simply said by his divine will and power be. Now, I want us to understand God, the awesomeness of God. You hear me? We need to understand the awesomeness of God. Now look, I don't think you'll think of God the same after today. I want you to understand that when David went out as a young shepherd boy and he loved God even then, And he looked at the stars as we see, as he wrote in Psalm chapter 8. And he said, uh, he prayed, when I look at the works of your hand, and he sang about it, and how marvelous and how vast it is. And I compare myself to that. What am I? What is man that you are even mindful of him, that you would even consider thinking about him? But did you know the observable observable universe by the naked eye is about 1,500 bodies, stars and planets, mostly stars. 1,500. The ancients actually counted the stars. And they arrived at about 1,500 stars. Of course, God had said, they're as the sands of the seashore. The Bible says they're innumerable. And they are innumerable. Because the moment you reach a number, the number changes. Because the universe continues to grow and expand. There are new stars being created, new planets being created all the time. You can never number the universe. But they've put the galaxies at about 100 billion. Uh, Listen to me. 100 billion galaxies. And I'm saying this to illustrate how great God is. The one who called you and gave you the right to call him Father. Think about that. How big is God? 100 billion galaxies. There's between 200 and 400 billion stars along with about 100 billion planets in our one Milky Way galaxy, which by size comparison is puny. It's a tiny speck. Do you understand the vastness of this universe? And then you understand the, the unfathomable power of our God. And yet he knows how many hairs are on your head. There is nothing that is hidden from his sight. Do you hear me? You can't hide. You can't hide anything from him. There is nothing that is hidden in his sight. He knows when every sparrow falls to the ground. And this universe, listen to me, that God created, and let's say this building is space. The universe, you would not see the speck right here in this universe, in in the existence, because there is no end to space. Now, it's interesting to me that scientists don't, no one, uh, you know, questions them or challenge them about this, or I haven't heard. Where did space come from? You acknowledge that the universe, physical universe, material universe, is expanding into nothing. Yet it exists there. What once was nothing, one split blinding moment, is now part our universe, occupies that piece of nothing. But it's not nothing. And it's more than God's domain. Because a domain by nature suggests that there are boundaries. There are no boundaries. None. I wonder if any scientists say, I mean, I would say, where did the space come from? What is space? I don't mean space within our universe. I'm talking about the space that our universe is expanding into. What is it? Well, I know what it is. It's called eternity. 
That's what it is. When they peer through those telescopes and they look at those farthest galaxies and they're speeding away, they even discovered now, which they thought was impossible, they're rethinking Einstein's theory. Because Einstein believed that nothing can go faster than the speed of light. And light is 186,000 miles per second. Five seconds goes by, there's a, hundred, there's a million miles that has been covered by light. Our sun is very, it's so big, it looks close to us. We feel the warmth. We, it's so close we can't look at it directly, and then we can look at the other suns that are so far away they appear as stars. But our sun is so near us, we cannot look at it without it actually destroying our eyesight. There's people in Africa that used to worship the sun, and they would stand and try to gaze at the sun, and they would go blind. They would lose their sight. Yet, traveling at 186,000 miles every second, you know how long it takes for the light of the sun to reach us? Nine minutes. Nine minutes. Every five seconds, it travels a million miles. Five seconds, not five minutes. Yet it takes over nine minutes when we even look out of our peripheral vision at the sun, we're seeing the sun as it was nine minutes ago. We're in fact looking back in time. When you look at the stars, you are peering back in time. But God is timeless. God is eternal. God is immortal. Space is timeless. When our universe expands into empty space, time begins wherever it touches, for our, our universe continues. It continues. So our universe has a specific age every moment and a specific size every, every moment, but it's changing every split second because those those, what I was saying is those galaxies, they have now, just this is recently, this has been within the last month or two, that, um, that they've discovered some bodies that they believe are galaxies that appear to be traveling, distant ones, faster than the speed of light, which they believe to be impossible. So we want to understand that eternity is the default. Our our universe is not the default. You, you know, as far as like our universe is, has an age, it's finite. It is made of material. Yet it is expanding into non-material space. And that space is eternal. We want to understand that the default existence is eternal and that God is the life giver. Life comes from God and goes back to God. If you, we need to understand also that death is not, is, is not what God planned. God is life. Death is not in his plan. Death is basically uh, the Corruption of something that is no longer useful. And therefore, he has to discard it like you would take a, an empty uh, ink cartridge out of your printer because it's no longer usable. It's empty. I want us to understand that we can't be thinking of self. The great God has a destiny for you and me. He created the universe, and he created the earth, and he created you and me, and everything else on this earth. And he created us for him. Do you hear what I'm saying? He did not create you for you. And he certainly didn't create you for the devil. He didn't create you for the devil to use, for you to go over and get in bed with the devil, and then the devil use you to break God's heart. But understand this. 
Think about it. The universe is expanding into space. Why doesn't someone ask? They ask questions like, well, will the universe ever come to an end? Will it ever collapse back upon itself and explode? There's many theories. They don't know. One thing they've discovered, though, is that this, the universe is so, I mean, the, the, the bodies in the universe, the planets and the stars and the quasars are innumerable. They are innumerable, and it's an ever-changing number. God created them. All in the sh- It's like decorating a room. It's like you're decorating your living room, or your, your, but your living room is not all there is. There's other parts of the house. The house is in a neighborhood. The neighborhood is in a town. The town's in the county. The county is in the, a state. The, the state is in a country. The country is in a continent or an island. And the, the continent is on the planet. The planet is in the solar system. And the solar system is in a galaxy. And the galaxy is in the universe. But the universe is in space. And expanding into space. Now there's no end to it. No one ever fears, well, oh man, what if our universe expands out and hits a wall? What if there's boundaries to space? What if it's if it is not if you know infinite and and there there are limits to space, just like there's limits to the universe. There is there are limits to the universe. It's limited all the time, but it's expanding, getting larger. But they don't worry about limits to space. They don't ever think, well, you know, we're gonna but our distant galaxies are going to come up and hit a wall at the edge of space and then crash and blow up and bounce back on us or something. You never hear that argument because they think, well, that's a ridiculous argument. They never ask the question, well, will the universe run out of room to expand in? I think that all the time. I witness this all the time by myself. I asked Chris this morning, I said, is there a superhero called Fat Man? You know? Wider than a speeding locomotive. <laughs> Unable to leap tall buildings in a single bound. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I, my, my, my waistline is expanding. I got to, you know, exercise some more. I'm not doing as much physical work anymore. So I understand, you know, that my pants, my shirts, my clothes, you know, it's finite. I can only expand so far in the ones I got. Well, what about the universe? It's expanding into something. It's growing. It's expanding. No one ever says, well, oh, no, man. What's going to happen? The universe is going to reach the edge and fall off the edge of the edge of space. And just fall off, right off the edge of space. And You know, what's going to happen to us when that happens? Nobody asks that question. Isn't it more logical to believe? Since we know that the universe is not all there is. In fact, if space, which certainly it is, is infinite, then as vast as this universe is, we can't, we can't even, it's un, it's, we can't even comprehend it at all. As vast as it is. It is, would not even appear visible in the whole existence of eternity. And God is omnipresent. Can't go anywhere where there's not God. And he's all powerful. Now I want you to understand, think about this. We don't know if God's got an infinite number of universes. We have no idea. We don't know what all is beyond the universe. Have no idea. But they know that there's something invisible, immaterial there that they call space. Hmm. Immaterial, invisible, eternal. Sounds like God. 
That's God's, where God resides. He resides here too. His throne is in the heavens. It's not in our heavens. When you look up at the stars and all the distant stars, and it's beautiful, you look through a telescope, you look at the Hubble pictures that come back of distant galaxies, unbelievable in their beauty. They're but decorations. 100 billion planets in the Milky Way. You know, the Milky Way is a spiral ga galaxy. You know, it's spiral. All kinds of different galaxies, but it's flat and it's spiral. And there's kind of like, you know, uh, little, I don't know, like uh, our, our appendages or arms that go out as it spirals out to the, it's dense in the middle, but then it's looser, you know, on the outside. We're on near the outside. If we were any farther inside, we would not know anything other than the Milky Way existed. We wouldn't be able to see it. God wanted us to see it at a time such as this. So this last generation could understand that our creator is it not only created the heavens and the earth, he goes, that is but a, it, it's so tiny you can, it's a speck, if at all, compared to everything else. He exists in the realm of infinity, an eternal realm, where death is not normal. Death is not the fault, the, the default. Existence, eternity, eternal life is the default. So when we think about God, we, like I say, we do not even know. They talk about, well, maybe there's multi-verses, multi-universes. Well, maybe they are. If they are, God created every one of them. When you think about that, you would think that you know God is doing other things God is about other things. We I mean, we came into existence 14 billion years ago, this universe. God has always been. He is the I am, the ever-living one, the one who exists. And yet, in all that, in the vastness of the universe, in the endless space, it has no beginning, it has no end. And God exists in all of it. He's omnipresent in all of it. And he created by his own um, will our universe all the way down to our tiny planet and a tiny solar system and a tiny galaxy. And in the scope of things, a tiny universe. And then he planned your birth and mine for his purpose. And that's why Paul said in Romans chapter 9, can someone say to their maker, why did you make me this way? Should I have some type of say-so? No. Not in reality. If you say no, then you will have no life because you're rejecting, you're saying no to life itself because he is life. He, when he says, I am, that's what it means, that he lives. So we want to understand that eternity is the default existence and how awesome God is. And we, we don't need to think of God in a way that regulates him or confines him to our universe. I mean, this is a, Listen, you have many things in your home. Your home is not defined by one little bitty thing. You got an ink pen sitting over there on, the, on the, your desk. Well, your, your home, your existence, and you are, are, are not defined by that, that little piece of, that little ink pen. That's a part of it. You don't spend all your time 
You know, of course, if you're God, you can spend all, you can spend, you don't, you're not confined by time, you're timeless. So he, he can be with us 24 7, every one of us 24 7 at any given time, and be a zillion other places with other things, with other beings that he has created. We're, and so anything, when you think about that, there's nothing God does that he doesn't do for a reason and have a purpose. That includes us. So we don't need to be people like to just like walk around with our head down to the ground thinking that this is all there is. Oh no, it's not all there is. Let's go to uh, Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah chapter 44. <clears throat> now, you know, if, uh, for example, and this is one of the favorite things among the new atheists that oppose the idea that there's a God or that the universe was actually created by an intelligent being, is they believe that, well, if, if God, if the universe had a creator, then who created God? God has to have a creator. But then when you think about, if, if, you, if you end up buying into that theory, then you have to say, well, the creator of God had a creator, and then the creator, creator of God had a creator, and you end up with an infinite regression back to eternity. Any way you go, listen, things exist. It is a reality that space exists. Not only the universe, but beyond the universe, in space and where it is expanding, exists. That's a reality. So where did it come from? Is it being created as the universe expands for it? I don't think so. I think it's already there. It's just in eternity, in the existence. You have you have uh, finite things, material things that have a beginning and an end, they're finite, but they're expanding into inf infinity. What they're expanding into is infinity, into an eternal realm. And if there is an eternal realm, then there is an eternal mind. Here in verse 20, uh, chapter 44, verse 24, Isaiah says, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and the one who formed you from the womb, I, the Lord, am maker of all things, stretching out the heavens by myself. And understand that everything that we, we see in the Bible talks about two um, places of existence, two domains, although domain's not a good word for it. We have the earth and, you know, the universe, the heavens that we live in, and then God talks about an eternal place called the third heaven, where God's throne is, that has no end. As he has no end, it has no end. So we need to Remember that, not think when we look up, when we pray and we think, well, God, you're, you're right up there. No, God is here. We're with him. He's with us. He's not confined to any of that. He's not confined to time or space. He can be all places at the same time, and, and he is. And so when we look at the universe, we can see the majesty of his creation. When we look at nature, we can see that even here on the earth. But consider that God is so vast, so awesome, that we're only seeing what he's created within the realm of this universe. That's all we see. That's all now we see. Can you imagine what wonders lay ahead for us? I mean, really, what wonders lay ahead for us? 
There is no end to what God has even created. There's no beginning and no end. We can't comprehend that because everything that we see has a beginning and end. But if you come to the conclusion there must be a beginning to it all, then that doesn't make sense either. See, because then you say, well, what existed before that? Thus, thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the one who formed you from the womb. God wants us to know who our Redeemer is. I am the Lord, and I am maker of all things. I stretch out the heavens by myself, and spreading out the earth all alone. I cause the omens of boasters to fail, make fools out of diviners, causing wise men to draw back and turning their knowledge into foolishness. I confirm the word of my servant, perform the purpose and perform the purpose of my messengers. So he has a plan. Let's go back to chapter 40. He has a plan for every single thing. And let us not forget that he made you in his image. Now, if you will not yield to him, then he cannot use you. And we already know that these present heavens and this earth are going to collapse and burn. They are temporary. They were never meant to be eternal. God gave man mortal life with the option, not more than an option, the invitation to receive eternal life. He put both, listen to me, he put both trees in the garden. Well, you're going to choose one or the other. You're going to choose the tree of life What are you eating of? You're going to choose the tree of life. Are you going to choose this world? You're going to choose the the pleasure of eating of the forbidden fruit. Oh, well. You know, it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, one of them causes death. God said, in the day you eat of that tree, you will die. God has called us. He's given us his word. He's given us his way, his culture. The culture way beyond this universe. The culture that has no, uh, of a domain, an existence that has no beginning or end. And he's called us to live out that culture. And he has given us the Holy Spirit by which he and Jesus dwell in us to lead us in his way. And to reject that, to reject it, would simply mean that you're choosing death, that you're laying down the invitation to life. Maybe you receive the earnest of life because you're bab- you repent, you're baptized, you receive the Holy Spirit. Okay. You have life, that that is the down payment, that is the earnest of life, but you can lose it. You can lay it down. You will follow one of two ways. You're going to follow God's way, you're going to follow the devil's way. The devil is a mere created being. He's a mere created being. He's restricted to this planet and this tiny solar system and this tiny galaxy and this universe that seems vast to us, but in the scope of eternity, it is so tiny you can't see it. And when we look at outer space, we don't see, and because we don't see what is visible or what is material, it's not material. It's not material. It's only material once material expands into it. But it's not. Now, I remember reading a story once about Henry Ford. You know who Henry Ford is? He is 
the founder of Ford Motor Company, and he is the inventor of the Ford automobile. Now, Henry Ford invented the automo that, his automobile. He knew how to build the automobile. He's not somebody that said, hey, you know what, I want controlling stock in a car company like today. He actually knew how to build the car. He designed an assembly line in order to build the parts and to put it together. He was proud of it. His goal was to make the automobile affordable for the common person. And he did with the Model T and then later the Model A. Before that, all cars were handmade by you know, a person or two people. And so they were very, very expensive. But he created the assembly line where people just learned to do one specific skill and put certain things together and then you know, it made the car affordable. He began putting out a car, you know, like about every minute or something like that. So it was affordable. He was driving on the highway one day alone, and he saw up ahead that there was a Ford. It was black. You know, Henry Ford said, you know, you can have any color you want as long as it's black. He didn't paint them any other color. They're all black. So he's driving along and he sees a car, a Ford, with the, on the side of the road with the hood up and a guy bent over there and the engine working on it. Young man. So he thought, well, I'll, I'll see what I can do. I'll stop and help that young man. He, he pulled up behind him and he got out. By this time, Henry Ford's an older guy. And he said, uh, son, you having trouble? Can I help you? <laughs> well, the guy was... You know, some people get pretty irritated working, you know, working on cars, kind of like Michael doing plumbing. You know, you just need to stay out of Michael's way when he's doing plumbing because he might throw something and you accidentally you might get hit. Plumbing and Michael don't work together too well. But I've seen people like that. I'm like, as far as working on cars, no. Not when it's changing parts or something like that, no. I would be taking God's name vain too much if I were doing that or be tempted to because you're always hitting your hand or something. Anyway, Henry Ford came out, I mean, his car, and he's walking up there, and he said, son, can I help you? You having trouble? Can I help you? And the guy was upset. Young man. He said, leave me alone, old man. You go your own way. Anything you can do, I can do, and I can do it better. I can, I, I can take care of my own car. You just get in your car and go on. Mr. Ford didn't say anything. He just quietly, without complaint, just walked back and got in his car and drove off, left the man there with car trouble. Now what that young man didn't know was is the guy that stopped to help him was the creator of that car. He created that car. He designed the car. He could tell the young man what was wrong with the car, and he would know whether they could fix it on the spot or whether they would have to take it in for a mechanic. You see? And it's the same way with God. God is our creator. He created us for a purpose. Now, the reason why that car was on the road is because something was wrong with it. It wouldn't run. It stopped functioning. It stopped fulfilling the purpose for, for which it was made. It was made to take, to replace horses and a horse and buggy and to take people in comfort with a roof over their head where they needed to go. We've all had cars. They got to the point that they were just not worth fixing anymore. You couldn't really fix them. You might fix one thing, then something else would go wrong. Amen? Well, that's the same way with any created thing. And we are a created thing. So what are we created for? Well, we're not created to transport people like a car. We're created to be God's administration we're created to be children in God's family. God is expanding his family. Therefore, 
Jesus died when we went astray and we became corrupted. We were on the side of the road. And the hood was up and we were working on ourselves trying to say, why won't this thing work? The Creator comes along and many people say, you know, and the Creator says, can I help you? I know, but I won't force myself. And when you deny Him, you're denying the only one that can fix the problem. This is why God has given us the Holy Spirit. That's a good illustration for Holy Spirit, for the workings of the Holy Spirit, where you deny the lead, the guidance, the direction of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the mind of God working in you. And the Holy Spirit knows what we need and will guide us in the right way. But if we choose to go our own way, then we are not useful to God. And God is not unjust in discarding something that will not perform the task that it was created to do. You and I do it every day. You throw, a th- you, you, know, you throw things away every day. You throw food away every day. Food gets spoiled, you throw it away. Why? It's spoiled. That's why you throw it away. And when it's spoiled, it's no longer useful. Matter of fact, it's harmful. So we need to realize that God is all-powerful, all-knowing. He is awesome. The default existence in everything except what we know in this universe is eternal. And the universe is expanding into that what science call empty space, though it's not empty, it's just they cannot see what is there. God can make it empty if he wants to. Here in Isaiah chapter 40, notice verse 18. To whom will you liken God? How are you going to compare? Or what likeness will you compare with him? As for the idol, well, a craftsman cast it. A blacksmith plates it with gold. A silversmith fashions chains or silver. And the person that is too poor to have an idol made, well, he'll just cut down a tree and have some craftsman make an idol for him. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood From the foundations of the earth, it is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. It's he who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. And again, this is just reducing it to what we know in our universe. God is not just operating here. I mean... He was doing something before 14 billion years ago. He'll be doing something else, and we will too after this is over. There is infinity out there that God operates in. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He it is who reduces rulers to nothing, who makes the judges of the earth meaningless. In verse 27, Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? The Lord doesn't know what I'm doing. I can, that, listen, it's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. Everybody knows. My way, is, they say, my way is hidden from the Lord. And the justice do me escapes the notice of my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. I mean, you're not going to say, well, he's asleep. He's dozing off. He doesn't know. Oh, yeah, he knows. He knows everything all the time, everywhere. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks, 
might he increase power. Though you grow weary and tired, the vigorous young men stumble bad, and vigorous young men stumble badly. Yet those who wait upon the Lord will gain strength. They will mount up like wings, with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. What would it be like to be eternal? To live in the reality of eternity where there is no death. Death is foreign. Death, we understand death is an enemy. We fear death. We, we try to stay alive. But in the physical, we can't stay alive. But we can still be alive in Christ if we yield to him and we don't deny him. You know, God says in Romans chapter 9, uh, you know, the apostle said that in, in a house there are many vessels. I mean, there's this vessel for common use. There's another one for, for uh, special uses, you know, for holy uses and, and things like that. In other words, he's saying there's many things in the house. But then he says, you brethren, you're created to be vessels for honor. You're created for that. God cannot give us honor if we resist him. Amen? If we push him away, he, he cannot honor us. He's not an old man sitting in a wheelchair somewhere, or in a rocking chair somewhere. This is God. We can't even fathom the greatness of the invisible God that can just speak, just speak his will in a blinding moment. And our universe, which is all we see, comes into existence simply because the I am said, be. There is nowhere you can hide from God. There's nowhere you will go where God is not there. He is God. He's omnipresent. He is all-powerful. He is not limited in any power. He is power itself. All things that we see, that, that all energy, all power that we see come from Him. All life that we see come from Him. There is no life. Oh, people will, will complain about, well, why can't I just do what I want to do? How come, you know... You know, God has no people in hell. Listen, the earth is not going to be here. You really want to be alive? Or God just give you life forever and you want to be here when the, when the heavens roll back and the earth and the heavens are burned up and the rocks melt and it's, it ceases to exist, burns completely till there is nothing? <laughs> well, that means you're going to go with it. But God didn't, God didn't create that for you. God created you for a new heavens and a new earth. God created you to actually be in his family. But you can only be in his family if you yield to his will and accept and follow the culture of that family. Amen. Hebrews chapter 4. Here in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. Now, the context of this, of course, is the apostle Paul is saying... Verse 1, therefore let us fear. And the reason why he said that, because he talked in chapter 3, as you see in the last couple verses, um, those who sinned, verse 17, fell in the wilderness. He's talking about Israel. And he swore that they would not enter his rest. And who weren't going to be able to enter his rest? Those who were disobedient. When you're disobedient, what are you disobedient to? Well, you're resisting 
uh, the function. You're, res you're resisting the f fulfilling the, fu the function for, for which you were made. God made you to do to fill something. You throw things away all the time that stop doing what you bought it to do. It gets to the point where you can't sharpen your sisters, your scissors anymore. Well, then you know you get you a new pair. You throw it away. You see what I'm saying? So it says, verse 19. They were in verse of chapter three. Uh, so we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Now here, the apostle is warning the Hebrews. In chapter 1, he says, do you know who God is? Do you know who Jesus is? God the Father warned us through his own son. Do you know who that son is? Well, he is the exact radiance. Well, look, just because you saw him in the flesh, or you heard about how he was here in the flesh and how he died on the cross, don't let it escape your attention that he existed with God the Father from all beginning. It was he and the Father that said, let there, let there be light. It was he and the Father that said, uh, let us create man in our image, you see. So don't let that escape your attention, Amen. And he's warning them. And he's saying that in times past, he spoke to us through prophets and other means. But in these last days, he spoke to us through his son. And by the way, his son is the exact radiance of him. Had no beginning and nor end of days. And he is greater than the angels. And the earth is but a footstool for his feet. And then he goes on to say, he's spoken to us through him, God directly. So how can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And that's the context. And he goes on to say, chapter three, he said, listen, they heard, they heard his word, but they didn't obey him. And they provoked him. Our fathers tested him. They tempted him. They resisted him. They were stiff-necked. And God became angry and said, they will not enter my rest. And verse 12 of chapter of 3 says, take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day by day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. That's the context by which we get to in chapter four. It's basically showing who it is that have, has created us and that Jesus was also God and created all things. And then when we get to chapter four, verse 13, it says, Chapter 12, he says, he can judge the intentions of your heart. Chapter thir verse 13 says, and there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to deal with. That's who we stand before. That's who we live before right now it is the one where there is nothing hidden in his sight. They're open and laid bare. We can hide things from each other, but you can't hide things from God. And then he says, therefore, since we have a high priest who is, has passed through the heavens, Jesus, Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, verse 27. Jesus said, What I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light. And what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim upon the mount housetops. Now notice verse 28. Do not fear those who kill the body. We do a lot of things, or maybe we... we uh, don't do some things we should do, especially in spreading the gospel, because of fear. 
we let fear control us. But God says, don't let fear control you. I haven't given you a, a spirit that will produce that kind of fear. I've given you a spirit that if you allow it to, it will cause you to fear me. And we see that right here. He says, do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. But rather fear him, that is God, who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And it's not God's will. It's not God's will. But he has no choice. if people will not yield to him and to his purpose. I mean, you know, the idea that people say, well, I know, but I don't think a loving God, you know, he, he's going to let me live. Well, you won't live if you don't receive life. And you can't receive life without receiving his life. And he laid down that life for you to receive it. He suffered. He became a man. He became a mortal human being to the point to where he could be tempted and he died for you. You and I were corrupted. Yet he says, I'll try to fix it. I'm going to try to fix it. He said, the only way to fix it is for me to die. I have to become one of them. I have to overcome. And I have to submit myself to death on the cross. So what do you think God thinks for those who trample underfoot that sacrifice? Who take that sacrifice lightly? There's no one going to enter the kingdom of heaven who has been living in the land of shifting shadows. The children of Israel, not only their sin wasn't just that they sacrificed to idols, they worshiped idols. They didn't stop going to the temple of God. They didn't stop, uh, you know, observing the holy days. They didn't stop giving, stop giving offerings to God. They didn't stop praying to God. They just continued in the ways of the world with it and joined it to us. There will be no forgiveness for fornicators. There will be no forgiveness for homosexuals at judgment if they push away the sacrifice of Jesus. Those who follow the deeds of the flesh, as we see in Galatians chapter 5, they will not be in the kingdom. Anyone who commits immorality will not be there. God's word plainly says he's warned us over and over. No thief, no fornicator, no one who is immoral, no one who practices sorcery, no one who destroys your temple. First Corinthians chapter 3 says, do you not know that you're a temple of God because God dwells in your body? Do you not know that if you destroy your temple, God will destroy you? A lot of people are careless with their temple. Well, there's only one way, and it's his way. And we can't say our little finite existence here on this earth of what, 80 years, 70, 80, 90 years, however long it is, that somehow we say, okay, this life which you have given me, you have given me life energy gifts and the means to do what I made you for, to do that will bring glory to me and will allow me to give glory to you, bestow glory and eternal life on you, which is my will, and welcome you into my family. Uh, it only works one way. 
So if we go the other way, it, it won't work. So he's saying here, fear God, fear him. Uh, one person can kill you once. But God can put you in the lake of fire for the second death. And these idiots that just say, well, I don't know why I can't. I mean, I, why does God have to? I mean, just because I don't agree with God and I don't follow God in all these things and I do what I want to do, I'm not a bad person. So why is it that God, well, listen, there's a lot of things. When an ink pen runs out of ink, you don't look at the ink pen and say, well, boy, you're a bad ink pen. It's gold, that ink pen. You don't expect the ink pen to last forever. And it's got a purpose to fulfill. And when it stops fulfilling that purpose, well, you either you know, put a new cartridge in it if it's those kind of pens, or you throw it away and pick up another one. That's the way it is. We understand that. God has made us to where we understand that something that does not fulfill the purpose for which we use it for or we need it for is not useful. Who was it that said, all that is not eternal is eternally useless? It may have been Spurgeon. I don't remember. But all that is not eternal is eternally useless. And of course that makes are you living your life, are you submitting to God, understanding that he is, yeah, listen to me, he, it's, it's a big thing to give you eternity. That is a, that's a pretty weighty thing. That's a gigantic trust. I'm going to trust you with eternity. I'm going to trust that you're not going to rebel against my culture and do what Satan did and try to rise up at my throne and corrupt his, the, all the angels that I put under his charge. I'm going to trust that you're not going to do that. Uh, you know, Satan is not eternal. He's going to be turned to ashes, we see in Ezekiel chapter 28. He's going to be cast in the lake of fire, and eventually he and his demons are going to be burned to ashes. But he, say, so now he created them where they could, as long as they're in his will, they would continue to live. We're created mortal, but in the very first garden that God put the first man and the woman in, there was the tree of life that they could freely eat of. There wasn't a gate there. And God said after they sin, we need to remove them because they might reach out and eat of that. And of course they would have. They would have headed straight for it. But of course that wouldn't be a permanent, probably. We find that even, you know, after the return of Christ, that there's going to be uh, the tree of life, and the people can partake of that tree of life, and they'll need to partake of that tree of life if they're flesh in order to continue to have eternal life. But once God is, what He's offering you and I is not just eternal life, He's saying, I'm going to give you an eternal body. I have for you an eternal, incorruptible, a body that doesn't get, a body just like mine, it won't never get tired. A body that is perfect in that it can experience the, the, the perfection of joy and pleasure and happiness. So it's a pretty weighty thing to say, can I trust you with an eternal body that cannot be destroyed? Can I trust you that you are shown me that you're trustworthy, that I will give you eternal life in an eternal, incorruptible, incorruptible body? It's a big thing. God searches you. He searches the heart. He wants to know. And if he sees that you're not faithful in these little bitty things now, He knows you won't be faithful in the big things. Understand your calling. Think about why you're called. What are you called for? And then understand 
the majesty and the awesomeness of he who calls, the I am, the ever living one. No beginning of days, no end of days. We cannot comprehend the fullness of God, not even remotely. We don't have anything to compare him to. He is, I am. He exists. So he says, fear those who, don't fear those who can kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. But rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now notice verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? Sparrows were acceptable offerings to God, and they sold two sparrows for a penny in the market so that people could offer them as an offering to God. He said, and he's saying, look at how you know, the worth put on a sparrow is a half a penny. That's it. Your worth, you're so valued to God that he became a man and gave himself. You're so valued to God, he wouldn't let you just die and fall to the ground. He wants you to receive him in the life of him in you by the power of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit cannot operate or remain in a corrupt body. Can't. If the mind is unsound, the Holy Spirit cannot operate properly. The Holy Spirit is like Henry Ford in the sense that you can say, you know, I'm a way I'm doing my own thing. I'm doing it my way. I don't need you. Go on. I got this. I can handle it myself. And then we end up, we spurn the Creator. So he says, are not two sparrows? I mean, this illustration, I mean, is really powerful. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? They're a half a penny each. Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And every and the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Think about the awesomeness of God. Our universe, our whole universe. Well, first, our earth and our solar system and even our galaxy of about 500 up to 500 billion stars and planets is but a speck in the universe. And the universe is not even a speck in the vastness of eternal space, which is infinite. And that is, well, it has no end, no beginning, and that's in any direction. Can't comprehend that, but that's God. God is there. And there's many things we don't see. It doesn't mean they're not there. God is invisible unless he wants to appear. He is naturally invisible to the human eye. You know. See, there's a reality that way beyond what we see here on this earth. So he says, but the very hairs on your head are numbered. They're all numbered. Now he knows that. And put that again in context with that's here on this earth, in this solar system, in this universe, in this galaxy, in this universe, in the vastness of, well, there is no beginning or end. Amen. Yet he knows. And he said, do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. This First Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1. We see in verse 17, 
Timothy says of God, he says, now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God. Hear it again. He is eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Now in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, we won't read it for a second time, but we see that God has placed eternity in the heart of man. That's why you know that death is foreign. Death is not, was never to be the norm. God, God never created the earth to experience death. Now, he probably knew it would happen because he, pro he probably knew that people, uh, certainly he could know if he wanted to. But God doesn't want to know everything. He does know everything he wants to know. But he doesn't know your sins after you repent of them because he says, I'll remove them from my memory. In Hebrews chapter 10, they're removed from his memory because that's his will. Now let's go over to Romans chapter 5 quickly. Uh, and we see that death is the enemy. God created us to have life with him. Amen? In chapter 5 verse uh, 8 of, uh, of uh, Romans, we find, But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the, through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. Verse 12 Therefore, just as though, as through one man sin entered into the world, that is Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Verse 17, but if by the transgression of the one death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. Now, in Adam we have what? Death. In Christ we have what? Life. So if you leave Christ, you leave life. Amen. And you can leave Christ by going back to the world and doing the things of the world, joining yourself to the world, to the enemy, to the God of this world. Verse 19, For as through the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one the many were made righteous. The law came in that transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more because where there is the law, people know. And when they, they know that they're transgressing a specific command. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now let's go over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. We see, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. But since by a man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. That's the two Adams. For as, as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order Christ, the first fruits, after that, those who are Christ that is coming. 
Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom of God to the Father, when he has abolished all rule and authority and power, for he must reign until he puts all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that will be abolished is death. In verse 53, for this perishable, that's our body, must put on the imperishable. You understand, if you don't put on the imperishable, you will perish. You must be clothed with the imperishable. And that comes only from the only one who is imperishable. And that is God. But this perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. You don't already have it. Contrary to what you hear out here. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Not your own, but the work of God. Knowing that your tool is not in vain in the world. I won't go there, but we know what John 3.16 says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. That's what it takes. You do not have life in yourself. It's, a, it's such a fantastic honor when you think about the awesomeness, unfathomableness of God and knowing that he's called you He's called you not only to be forgiven of your sins, and he's called you to be a place where he may dwell, to be a living temple for a living God by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us not grieve the Holy Spirit. Let us not quench the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will be like Henry Ford, and if we just push the Holy Spirit away, well, the Holy Spirit just, like Henry Ford just got back in his car and just left the man to himself. Let us not say to God, leave me alone, get out of my life. I want to do things my way. I want to dabble around in the world and the ways of the world. You better get that out now. You hear me? You better get that out now because it will corrupt you. A little leaven leavens a whole lump. It doesn't stay, you say, well, I can do this, I'll do this, this. No, you won't. It don't stay that way. Just like the universe, it's expanding. And it'll drive your life right out. The Holy Spirit leaves. That person is doubly dead, according to 2 Peter chapter 3, and, or 2 Peter chapter 2, and Jude, the book of Jude. Hebrews chapter 2, we're not going to read that either, but we find there what Jesus did, what God did for us. That he became a man. That he shared in the likeness of the flesh. And that he's not ashamed to call us brethren. Let's not make him ashamed. Let's make him, let's give him joy, amen. Consider the awesomeness of God. Is all knowing, is all powerful. He is eternal, he's timeless, he's immortal. He is all and in all. That's what we see in Colossians, I think, chapter 2. Consider that you were created by him and for him and for his purpose. And it's a glorious purpose. 
For what he has created you for, there are no rivals. You're a special creation for him. A special role. That's why you don't find anyone else exactly like you. There is no one exactly like you. You're valuable in the uniqueness of who he created you to be. You have a great many parts in the body. We're members of the body of Christ. They don't all do the same thing. They don't look all the same. You find the same thing in anything that operates, that works like a machine. There's, there's parts that are working in the machine. They're all necessary. And one part doesn't carry over and try to do another part's work. You know, if you're working on a car, you're working on a house, you quickly find out that a crescent wrench doesn't work for, uh, doesn't work as a screwdriver. Many things like that. But it's, it's functional and it, it works for what it was made for. Consider the price that he paid to bring you back. After we sin. Consider the unspeakable joy and the glory to come. And consider the consequences of choosing to deny him. And what we will miss when you think about that. 